Hey everybody, great to have you along and welcome in to Right to Play in Conversation, powered by National Bank. I'm David Amber, host at Hockey Night in Canada and the NHL on Sportsnet. And I'm pleased to welcome in two very special people uh, to lead tonight's discussion, Jermaine Rock Anderson, of course, a 12-year pro uh, basketball player. You may have seen him out uh, overseas across the Atlantic doing his thing. We'll, we'll get to Jermaine in just a matter of moments because he's been a pivotal person uh, with regards to tonight's conversation on financial literacy. Uh, he's currently the GM of the Hamilton Honey Badgers in the CBCEBL, that's the Canadian Elite Basketball League, and also the founder of 50 for Free, which is a great youth initiative helping uh, youth in the community as far as financial literacy is concerned. As well, we got to welcome in Executive Vice President uh, Lucy Blanchett at National uh, Bank. And, and Lucy, let's start with you before we get to Jermaine to lead this conversation. Uh, some words on tonight's discussion about financial literacy and, and right to play in the National Bank. Perfect. Thank you. So thank you all for being with us this evening. I'm very happy to be representing National Bank tonight. We've been uh, supporting right to play for many years now, and uh, we're very proud to present the webinar series right to play in conversation. This evening, we will be discussing financial literacy through play. And this is a topic that I care deeply about. Uh, I strongly believe that it's important to have sufficient knowledge uh, to feel confident in making the right financial decisions in our daily lives projects. So I think uh, financial knowledge should be an essential part of our education from an early age, but it's also never too late to acquire that knowledge. So at National Bank, we are promoting financial literacy as part of our mission as a financial institution. And that's why we're proud to partner with organizations such as Right to Play. November is Financial Literacy Month, um, and I think that topic is so important right now when the sanitary crisis is affecting households and the economy. So my hope is for everyone to ask themselves the right questions, seek advice, and strengthen their knowledge. You're less anxious when you feel in control, and you can't put a price on peace of mind when it comes to your finance. And it is through events like this one that we make progress as a society. So thank you everyone at Right to Play for organizing this event. And I hope you enjoy the webinar and that you'll be taking lots of notes from Jermaine's insights. Mm -hmm. Well said, that's uh, Lucy Blanchett. Thank you so much, Executive Vice President at National Bank, a key sponsor to make this evening come true. And uh, Jermaine Rock Anderson, uh, a keynote speaker and someone who's uh, lent his voice to a very important initiative in financial literacy. Uh, we, we got, before we get to the financial literacy, and that's very important, that's why you're here, but Jermaine, The Rock, give, give me The Rock, the, the genesis of the nickname Rock. The Rock The Rock was given to me by a childhood friend. And I got the name when I was about in grade eight or grade nine. And I was given that name because I was cut up, veiny. I always had a basketball in my hand. And to be honest, it, it, it has stuck ever since. And um, I've been Rock since I was about 13 years old. So. Uh, a lot of people don't know my name, but <laughs> people that have, <laughs> have, you, have you met the other rock? <laughs> yeah, I've met a few. I've met a few. <laughs> I like to say I'm the original. I'm the original rock. <laughs> there you go. You're Canada's rock for sure. And uh, and a rock solid career. And, and you've done it all. For, for Some people might not be familiar with, with what Jermaine has done in his career, but let's walk you back. Uh, Eastern Commerce was a superstar there uh, in high school. Follow that up with the Fordham Rams. Uh, a great collegiate career, 12 years as a professional basketball player, has thrown on the Canadian uniform, you know, 75 plus times playing for the national team for over a decade. And, and then you transition and, and you now are the GM of the Hamilton Honey Badgers in the CEBL. Uh, a prolific basketball career, but we're here to talk about uh, finances and literacy in the financial community. What made you think like, because you went back and you did an MBA then, uh, at Ryerson University at the Ted Rogers School of Management. What made you sort of think at, at what point in your career, I really want to take care of myself from a financial standpoint and help others with some of the questions I might have had as a young man becoming a businessman? Uh, to be honest, it, it also was my passion for the community, right? And I wanted to be able to combine two things that I'm passionate about, which is basketball and finance. Hmm. I know for me growing up, uh, I, I made a ton of mistakes um, on the personal finance side. And I think if I had, you know, the understanding, um, the financial literacy understanding, I wouldn't have made those mistakes. And I know for one in particular, 
I always, um, the one thing my grandparents taught me was to, to save, right? And it's because they didn't necessarily have much. And so when I started my professional career, um, I think the tax-free savings account uh, was in probably about three or four years in. And so it was just like, hey, you know, you should invest some of your money in a, in a GIC. So I took, you know, I took some of the money I made and I poured it into a GIC. Um, but then over time, I realized that, you know, I was actually losing money due to inflation. Mm-hmm. Right. So even at times when you have a mindset to save, um, you can still make mistakes. And I want to help, you know, people within my community and the next generation um, not make similar mistakes that, that I've made. And you mentioned the mistakes. You mentioned the GIC mistake in particular. Were there a certain time when you just said, I, I need someone to help me. I need someone to mentor me and help me through making these financial decisions. And I don't have that person. How, how did you go about that? Yeah, I, I, I did initially. But then I realized, why not just take it upon myself and learn? Mm-hmm. Right. So I was in between contracts one year and I decided to um, I was encouraged by a family friend to get my insurance license. And and then I came back after the following season and I, and I, and I did my mutual funds and, and, and acquired my, I got my CS, CSC. And I was able to make decisions on my own instead of having to rely on somebody else. And, and I, found, no, I found for me, when I've relied on other people, that's when I've made terrible mistakes, right? So for us as an organization, we want to empower the next generation to, to learn and to, to take control of their own finances. Which makes all the sense in the world. And quite frankly, we hear about, you know, we hear about that. We hear about these cautionary tales of professional athletes, uh, young men who've come into and women who've come into a, a huge sum of money and haven't been given the proper guidance on how to make sure that they save, that they prepare for their future, that they're thinking about their kids, their grandkids, etc. So what was the most valuable piece of advice you were given? Um, honestly, I, I would say just to just to continue to invest. Right. I think like I, I'm sorry to start at an early age. Hmm. Right? And I think that that's what that's the main thing that we're trying to teach, right? Like understanding the time value of money, right? So we want our participants to know that you know, starting at 18, you know, putting putting in this $25 a month, $50 a month, what that could look like by the time they're 65 and showing the difference if they wait until they're 35 and how much they'll end up losing, you know, in, in the process. So I think this time value of money um, for me is a, was the most important lesson. And just continuing to invest, you know, not mm-hmm. trying to tap the market and trying to outsmart um, the market per se, but just just being diligent and consistent. Jermaine, I think what sometimes keeps people from investing and testing out the marketplace is fear, a lack of knowledge and a lack of understanding. And so they say, well, I'm just going to keep my money in the bank. And we all know if you just plop your money in the bank and you don't invest it, it's, it's not the greatest way to, to grow your, your uh, wealth. Yeah. Um, how did you get over that fear? Because I'm sure there's a lot of young people watching right now who would love to take your advice, but don't even know where to start. Yeah, I think I think the most important thing is just just, get, just getting the knowledge, right? Like using whatever resources you have available, whether it's a family friend or an educator um, or just a Google search, mm-hmm. right? Doing as much as you possibly can to educate yourself so that you're making informed decisions. And then the reality is like, you know, you might make a mistake. But the most important, the most important thing is that you know that you're starting, um, you, you have a plan, and that you're trying to execute that plan. And I think that's the most important thing that any of us could do in in the, in the financial space. So, what makes you unique? I mean, you're not an adva- a financial advisor per se, in the sense that you're a community leader. You're taking the knowledge you've gained from your life experiences, plus uh, getting and graduating your MBA uh, again at the Ted Rogers School of Management at Ryerson University and you're helping out the community. How do you integrate it almost in the same philosophical way as right to play where you're not about, it's not about economics, it's not about math, but it's about sort of integrating a fun way for kids to relate to how to make sure they make the right financial decisions. How do you go about doing that? Yeah, honestly, we, we just took advantage of the, uh, of the rise in the game of basketball. Mm. Every summer when I, when I came back home, I saw that there were more AU teams, there were more you know, personal trainers, there are more um, on-court skill development people. And I was just like, okay, we, we know there's a need, right, on the basketball side. Um, I saw that, like, the cost of these programs are going up. So I was just like, okay, like, how can we combine the financial literacy piece, basketball, make it free of charge uh, for our participants? So once, once we were able to figure it out, um, we used basketball as the draw, 
um, to, to, to teach, you know, financial literacy and other life skills. And initially the, the students weren't as receptive, but over time they, they appreciate the financial literacy piece just as much as the basketball. So they know that the first hour is always going to be financial literacy or mm -hmm. um, an educational component, but then they know once they're done, they're going to get three hours of basketball. So it's a perfect marriage. Yeah, a little quid pro quo, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we'll help you out and you help us out. And and you know what? 50 for free is such a great initiative, uh, great philanthropic work being done by Jermaine uh, and the, in, in the community. What's been the feedback? What have you heard about the work you're doing? Um, to be honest, everybody's been receptive to it. Like, I think, I think there's this, um, this notion that like people don't necessarily want to learn about financial literacy, mm. but I think it's, it's, it's all about delivery and our educators have done an amazing job, um, in turning financial literacy into a fun topic. Um, our educators are extremely engaging and are based on our, you know, qualitative feedback, our participants, um, enjoy it. Um, they continue to come back each year. And if you continue just to, to grow and, and, you know, develop what works and to, uh, and to, you know, to figure out the kinks here and there, especially now with COVID, um, you know, we, we think we uh, have the recipe for success. And why specific, I imagine marginalized communities are suffering at a greater level. We've seen this with COVID, not just in health rates, but in, in uh, you know, the, the burdens financially, uh, those with less have been hit harder than those who are more in a more affluent community. So how specifically do you gauge your financial literacy to a community where maybe they haven't had all the formal education uh, to, to lead them down a good path uh, to financial success? Yeah, I think, I mean, to start, if we're just looking at the uh, numbers on the macro level, um, just looking at the averages, you know, 53% of Canadians are living paycheck to paycheck. Um, you know, the debt to income ratio is, you know, 177%, which means for every dollar of income, uh, we accumulate, you know, $1.77 in debt. Mm. Even alone, you know, debt is on the rise. Um, you know, if you look at consumerism, um, we're constantly bombarded, um, you know, to spend. Um, so if you just look at, look at things from a macro level, you see that it's, it's a disaster. Um, but as it relates to the community, I think the main difference is, is that the kids in marginalized communities don't necessarily have that safety net or that buffer. Mm -hmm. Right. So their margin of error is, is, is slim. Right. So we want to uh, plant as many seeds into their lives as possible um, so that they're on a path, on a path to create generational wealth. So it's not necessarily where you start, but, you know, if we could get our youth to, to start thinking now, then they could create wealth um, you know, for their family in the future. I love what you're saying. When we're done this, I'm going to have you talk to my two teenage kids and help <laughs> them out. Right. Because, you know, it's funny because we're in this we're in this generation and and we're in a society where consumerism is such a big thing it is about keeping up with the joneses and i want to have the freshest shoes and i want to have the, you know this and that which is great but you don't want to run yourself into the ground yeah. doing that and you got to understand that and you, you mentioned debt and that's i imagine as someone who's traveled overseas you played in a number of countries russia and germany etc and you, you played with guys young guys coming into a, a a fairly substantial amount of money, you must know of some cautionary tales of guys who ran themselves into debt and found themselves in trouble when they were flushed out of professional basketball. Oh yeah, yeah, 100%. Like I, I know guys that um, that spent all their money throughout the season over the summer, right? So as a, as a professional overseas, right, everything's covered, right? So housing, um, some teams they even provide meals, mm. right? And, you know, and the majority of our, our money is spent in, in the summertime, you know, once we're back home and with family and like, I, I've seen it, people lose themselves. I, I know for me, like I, I've made mistakes, like my first year coming back home and, you know, wanting my take, take my friends out and party and, and uh, especially when you're coming from nothing, right? Like it's easy mm -hmm. uh, to get caught in that trap. And, um, you know, it, it's, it, it's unfortunate, but it's something that happens um, <laughs> on numerous occasions. And, you know, that that's the thing, like we wanted to help people within our community and change their mindset to know, like, hey, having a tax free savings account is cool, you know, and instead of having a chain or a pair of Jordans right? and all that stuff is good as well, too, if, if you want to have it. But just making sure that there's a pecking order in place um, so that, you know, they're protected in the future. 
That makes so much sense. And it seems like it's common sense, but you know, again, people sometimes go on a wayward path because they're, they're led in the wrong direction. They're not getting the sage advice that uh, Jermaine Anderson's been able to provide. So forget about the professional basketball players and the guys who are making a, a, a you know, pretty substantial amount of money. What about the average person? I remember my, my first job in television after I finished school, I was making $17,000 a year. Granted, this was a long time ago, but I still, I was kind of living paycheck to paycheck. Uh, how do you uh, offer advice to someone, you know, in that tax bracket, someone who's just starting up and saying, I'd like to start accumulating a bit of wealth, thinking about my future, thinking about when I'm going to have a family. Um, but it's hard because I'm not making a ton of money right now. Yeah. I Honestly, it's funny because like there's this like preconceived notion that like the more money you make, like the better position that you're in, right? Like a person could be making thirty, forty, fifty thousand, and be in a much better position than somebody making two hundred, two hundred fifty thousand, right? With like, the right choices, you're right, absolutely. Choices, right. Mm -hmm. So it's just more so it's putting 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 away um, you know a, a bit every month, whether it's fifteen, twenty percent uh, each month. Uh, making sure that uh, an emergency fund is in place, um, you know, and, and obviously, like you know, you may have to you cur curb your lifestyle a little bit, um, you know, to make sure that you're able to do that. Um, and, and and honestly, if you have to, you know, move back home or rent a basement uh, basement apartment, whatever it is, I think it's just more so having a plan, um, more so than necessarily like how much you make, right? It's it's all it's all about what you're able to 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 save. Not, not what it is that you make. That's what I always say. Yes, uh, absolutely. And I think you're right. And you, you want to live almost beneath your means sometimes just to, to get ahead. There's a message here from a John Lashway we're both very familiar with. He's been a mentor of yours. Jermaine's wisdom is such a gift to all who will listen and put what they've learned into action. It's never too late in life to start making better choices. Uh, again, as someone who's been a mentor to you and who's a great professional, um, you know, what does it mean when someone like John Lashway reaches out with a comment, uh, really uh, singing your praises about things you've learned and how you're leading your life? No, honestly, it's a blessing. I mean, John is the reason why I have this position now. And he's absolutely right. I've made a ton of mistakes in my life and I continue to make mistakes and, um, and I've been able to figure it out. So um, I'll be the first to raise my hand, um, you know, as it relates to mistakes. Um, but he's right. You know, it's never too late to start investing. It's never too late to to change your situation. Um, it's never too late to create a path of happiness or to, um, you know, transition into that dream job or, you know, something that you're passionate about. Um, and especially now, I think with COVID, you know, we, we also we have more time now to reflect and mm. and to uh, and I know for me, I'm, I'm seeing things differently. Um, and and you know nobody ever would have expected that we would have uh, been going through a global pandemic but you know with that you know it's it's an opportunity for us to learn and and, and to grow from it we all need mentors we all need leaders in our communities and and i know john was uh, a mentor for you in many ways what life skills did he maybe teach you that you're now passing on to the community with your 50 for free uh initiative yeah i think the most important thing is that he put me in a position where uh, I've been able to make decisions, right? So being able to to control a budget, uh, mm -hmm. you know, for a professional sports team, um, is extremely invaluable. Uh, I've I've learned a lot over over the last year, and you know, obviously John has, you know, he's uh, almost like a godfather in, in in the business world of sports. So uh, I've learned a lot, and you know, I, I try to take bits and pieces from everybody, um, and, and and try to impart that impart that into the community. Mm -hmm. and, you know, and, and, and to be able to provide access, um, you know, for, for our program participants. And as we heard Lucy say at the beginning, November is financial literacy month, so it makes a lot of sense. You're not the only one preaching these uh, sage words of advice. It's something that we should really be reflecting on. And it's especially hard, as you mentioned, during this time of COVID, because it's thrown this massive economic wrinkle uh, for so many people. When parents approach you and they want to get their kids involved in your community program, 50 for free, what kind of questions are they asking you and what kind of advice are you able to lend them? Uh, this is more so just this much more so about the curriculum, mm. uh, what it is that we're actually doing, um, you know, and then more so the location, right? Because we have kids coming in from different areas and they just want to make sure that they're safe, obviously, with, you know, all the gun violence and everything that's, um, you know, is happening throughout the city. 
Um, so I just want to make sure they're, they're safe and that we're, we're, we're providing a safe environment uh, for them. But, you know, and the one thing that we try to tell them or and, and, and as a part of our long term plan is we want to get the parents involved as well. Right. So even though we're trying to plant as many seeds as possible, like I said, into into, into youth and, and students, um, we know that the parents are the, the, the catalyst for them to be able to build wealth. Right. So if they have, you know, an insurance policy or a savings plan or a state plan, um, then it'll make life easier for the the, uh, the participants that we have in our program. So we, we, we know that it's a it's a um, uh, it's all it's a community um, built. Right. We need everybody mm -hmm. involved, all the stakeholders involved. Um, but that's one thing we try to uh, preach to, to the parents and it's something that we're looking forward to doing, you know, moving forward. And Jermaine, for, for young parents out there, at what age is a good age and the right age maybe where a kid's mature enough to understand the messaging that they're getting from you? At what age would you say is a good age to start learning these lessons? <laughs> I would say while they're in the, while they're in the womb. <laughs> <laughs> I think, like, you know, just, just reading to them. Um, I, I know there's, you know, financial literacy coloring books. Mm -hmm. um, and it was created by Kiara McClendon out of the U.S. Uh, she's the founder of The Adventures of the Money Mavens. Oh, and, what, is a, what, is a, what does a financial literacy coloring book look like? What are you, what are you coloring in? Dollar bills? <laughs> yeah, it's, it, I mean, it, it's, it's designed to uh, engage the parent and the child. Right. So actually, I don't know where it is, but I have a, I have a copy. I, I ordered a copy. And um, and I think you could start as young as three, four years old. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and we, I look at the games hang up like Monopoly, Payday. Um, those games have a ton of financial literacy messaging in them. Right. It's just a matter of, um, you know, maybe talking about it, talking about the decisions. You get a chance to negotiate in Monopoly. Um, so I think I think you could start. As, as early as three, four years old, in my opinion. Mm, I, it's Listen, it's hilarious when you mentioned Monopoly. I'm not sure that's what you want to be teaching your kids. But hold on, I got a question here from Stuart Evans, right? How do you teach young kids and adults like myself about saving and delayed gratification? We, we touched on this a little bit about getting those new Jordans or saying, you know what? I'll put $20 aside every month for the Jordans, but I'm also going to take $20 a month aside and put it into a savings account. How do you teach that? Because that's a hard thing to teach. It's extremely tough. And I think it's just like through repetition, right? Because mm -hmm. like if you look at consumerism, right? We may, we, I know for me, I talked about a, something or a product. And then the next second I look at my phone and they're advertising the exact same thing that I was talking about, right? So I think it's just repetition, um, you know, showing illustrations that, hey, look, like, you know, $25 a month, um, you know, starting at 18, like this is what it could mm -hmm. look like in the next 20 years, 30 years. Um, you know, showing the importance of home ownership, different things like that, right? So it, it is hard, right? Because we all want the now, especially in today's day and age, where it's mm. all about instant gratification. Um, but yeah, I just think we just we just need to find ways to pretty much just push it down their throats <laughs> on a regular basis. Jermaine, what's your ultimate goal? Because you know you, you're you're a very ambitious guy. Uh, you've you've had such great success, obviously, uh, in the sport you love, and now you're having great success uh, in someone in the financial community. But the, the the bigger thing for you is the community activism that you're doing. So what's your, what's your ultimate goal in all of this? To be honest, uh, I'll say the ultimate goal for me is to be able to provide free financial literacy programming and every inner city community across Canada. Hmm. Starting with Canada and then we are going out across the globe. Right. So being able to provide free for programming um, through sport, you know, with the main focus on financial literacy, um, like I said, across Canada and then eventually across the globe. Right. So we want to plant, like I said, plant as many seeds as possible, hmm. um, you know, but use sport as the, uh, as the, as a draw. And this, I believe you started in 2015? No, we started in 2018. 2018, okay. So it's a little too early to sort of say, here are some amazing success stories because this takes a little bit of time. But I'm sure you've taken some people and helped some people guide them from a, a certain path, which was going to lead them maybe into more financial difficulties, take them over to a different path, which is leading them to some greater prosperity down the road. 
Um, what does that mean to you? Honestly, I love it. We, uh, you know, like uh, one of our participants, a uh, kid named Michael Rossi, he started a clothing line called Money's the Motive. Mm -hmm. And he, you know, he, he, he figured out how to market the product. He reached out to influencers. Um, and now people all over the city, uh, you know, I walk around, I see people with, you know, MTM sweaters and, and, and sweatpants. And he's only 18 years old. And, and uh, he had a vision um, and he, he ran with it. You know, and that's one thing that we, you know, we, we tr we're trying to accomplish is helping these uh, youth, young people identify their passions and, you know, pretty much helping them try to find ways to monetize those passions. Jermaine, I imagine if you walk into any regular high school right now and you're a gentleman off of Bay Street and you're in a three piece suit, you know, the kids might look up from their phones for two seconds in the classroom and then, you know, they don't relate to it. What does it mean, though, for you? Because you've got that equity built up when they say, hey, we have a professional basketball player coming in to talk to you. The ears perk up. Uh, people want to engage with someone who's had the life you've had. So how do you use that equity? Just like right to play uses that great equity of, you know, sport, uniting people, teaching life skills. How do you use that as a tool that helps you get your message across? Yeah, I think, honestly, it's just more so just being honest, right? Like I used to be somewhat like, um, jaded and, and and somewhat like subdued and quiet about my story mm. and now I'm open and, and I share and I and I let them know that you know I'm, I'm from the same environment that, that they're from I never knew my dad uh, my mother had me when she was 18 years old and and you know she she was incarcerated for a period of time my grandparents took me in um so I I, I make sure I, I explain that to them on the first day right so that they know like oh okay like he's coming from where we're coming from or he understands um, the struggle, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they need to stay there and be stuck, right? So, you know, they could use the 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 the, the street knowledge, the the um, um, just being able to navigate through that environment to their advantage, as they sort of you know develop their mindset and and uh, you know continue to grow and develop. We only have a couple minutes left here in this great conversation. Uh, right to play a national bank teaming up, Jermaine Rock Anderson providing the knowledge that you need as far as financial literacy goes. You have a pretty incredible story and you just gave us a few snippets of it, a uh, single parent and, and you know, growing up in a, in a tougher environment. Do, do you ever take a step back and sort of say, wow, uh, I'm in a place I didn't necessarily think I was gonna get to and it's pretty cool, but here I am. Uh, no, not really. I just, try to, I just try to live in the moment. Um, I know that I know that I'm blessed. You know, I know that you know God has done a lot for me, and He's provided, um, you know, a, a ton of people um, throughout throughout the course of my life that have helped me. So I'm extremely, you know, thankful for them. And honestly, like this this program is a way for me to, um, you know, give back, but also to thank them, right? Like I I can't thank all the people that have helped me, but if I could, you know, impart whatever knowledge or wisdom um, that I have into the generation, then I feel like um, it wasn't in vain, right? So I'm taking what they've given me and I'm you know, just trying to transfer it over. Well, you're incredibly humble, uh, incredibly knowledgeable and a pillar in the community. So thank you uh, on behalf of Right to Play, on behalf of National Bank to have your words of wisdom. Uh, it's important. And uh, Tanya Phillips, who is running the show here, uh, wanted to say Jermaine Anderson is a true example of Right to Play's main characteristic resilience. Thank you, Rock, for paying it forward to the next generation. Very well said by Tanya Phillips, uh, who's one of the key executives at Right to Play. So thank you, Jermaine. Thank I just wanted to so say much. thank you so much. Um, when I see you, I'll call you The Rock. And uh, mm -hmm. you keep doing your thing because uh, it's important. I, I want to also thank our key sponsor, National Bank, for helping put this together. So important, these conversations. Of course, Right to Play in Conversation will be back next month uh, with some more knowledge to drop your way as well. But for now, thank you so much uh, to Lucy Blanchett as well as Jermaine Rock Anderson. I'm David Amber from Hockey Night in Canada. Thanks for your time here. Right to Play in Conversation. <laughs>